affectionately known as Bowtie Combo, and I'm your host, Dr. Bowtie Todd, and I'm excited to share this journey and my personal mission with you, a mission where every day I seek to create spaces for all humans to belong and thrive together, one Bowtie Combo at a time. To kick off our first learning episode, today's Bowtie Combo will focus on a variety of perspectives and experiences around the discussions of I'm white and can I talk about race? but, um, when, and how. Before we get started, I would like to share our ground rules for today's discussion and a few housekeeping items. The Bowtie community has simple rules for engagement. Um, to have an effective dialogue, which I consider like the Bowtie way, um, it is in the way of my personal favorite acronym. If you never have met me before, here's your first time. Here in this is the Bowtie. And it's, and, and, and it's basically, um, around this whole philosophy of having conversations, everyday dialogue. Um, and I notice when I wear my necktie, you know, whether I'm going to the market, I'm in the, you know, the airport or flying to another country, people are usually curious about my necktie. And so I started to think, wow, if people approach me, um, you know, with the curiosity, if we can do those same type of concepts to everyday dialogue, um, how will the world, you know, look and how different will it be? So I want I came up with a quick acronym of how you can have everyday conversations and I'm going to share it with you all. Let's get started. So the first letter of bow tie is B and in any conversation, you know, I would like for you to be mentally present. So this next hour together, I know you're physically tuned in, but I would love for you to be mentally present um, and, and really um, alert. Okay, let's go to the next letter. O, open open to new ideas, okay? It's going to be things that we share. Um, they're going to be there, the panelists' perspectives. Uh, we're just asking for you to uh, be open to new ideas. You don't have to agree with everything. Uh, but of course, we definitely want to have our platform uh, treat everyone with respect, um, as well as have an open mind, open heart. That's, that's basically how you can go into this conversation today. The next letter is W, willingness. Willingness to share your own story and own your own truth. I believe that everyone on this call who's listening today has a unique story and it's up to you to share it. And so it's going to be times throughout our platform that you may want to utilize the chat and give your perspective. We welcome that. Now, I'm not sure if we have any bow tie wearers on the call or listening today, uh, but usually when I ask individuals, hey, um, you know, do you like bow ties? And they say, hey, I do like them, but the reason why I don't wear, you know, et cetera, because of this knot in the middle. So if you look at this knot in the middle, um, it's, it's like, I can't make it, you know, it's a little hard. How can I make that happen to make my necktie, the bow tie work when it's self tie? And I usually see this as the most challenging thing of conversations and dialogue. And that's really simple. The TIE, how do you tie it together? You know, and my friends today, I really will hope and our, our, our goal is conversation better than we came in and to tie it together. And so that is the simple rules, right? It's the bow tie combo. And so throughout today's conversation, um, of course, we are live on Facebook. We're live um, on the Zoom webinar. So feel free to utilize the check feature at any time. Um, so let's practice. Feel free to go ahead and introduce yourselves. I already see some people already introducing themselves. And tell us where you're tuning in from. Um, we are um, like I said, we have we are live on Facebook. Feel free to reshare the video. Um, and of course, at any chance, um, or I'm sorry, of course, at any time, um, you will have the chance to submit any questions you may have for our panelists. So feel free to use the Q&A button on the side. Also, if you hear anything today that stands out, feel free to talk about it on social media or share your engagement utilizing the hashtag Bowtie Combo so we can continue to dialogue with you. Now, all the rules are out of the way. Let's get started with today's discussion. I'm going to bring our panelists up here. All right, beautiful. So we're going to get started, and I really want um, our panelists to introduce themselves um, and really tell our viewers today um, a little bit about your story, um, high level, and your passion for this space today. And let's begin with my good friend, Tina. Hi, everybody. My name is Tina Van Steenberg, and I am a full-time professional public speaker. So in a normal world, I travel the country, and I spend my time mostly talking to women. 
I talk to women about why women need women, and I am on a mission to help women feel less alone in the world. There are a lot of barriers that are built up between us, and I'd like to help tear those down. Um, in our current world, I'm a full-time professional virtual public speaker, so <laughs> that's fun. Love me some Zoom conversation. I'm really glad to be here. One of the things that we were asked to share with you from the intro was how we find ourselves in this space. And the first thing that came to my mind was, um, and I'm sorry, James, I might steal your thunder here for a second, but um, I didn't know I was white until I was 19 because I grew up in a suburban white place and never in my life had thought about race ever until I went to an orientation leader training and was surrounded by people of all kinds of identities. And I thought my greatest identity was that I was a lifeguard. And so that moment, that activity was the moment where I learned how much I didn't yet know and how much I had to learn about my identity as a white person. That was the first moment I learned that people who are white actually have a racial identity and that it matters in the world. And so that shifted my perspective and keeps me in spaces like this, passionate about areas of social justice, diversity, inclusion, and education. And I live in Minneapolis. That's me. All right, thanks, Tina. If we can go down to my other great friend, everyone is great friends. So uh, Jess, bless us, with, bless us with your presence. Absolutely. Uh, well, I'm happy to be here. So uh, similarly to Tina in uh, kind of reviewing the prep calls, I think one of the things that's most fascinating about being a white person is that by virtue of being a white person, we rarely have had the opportunity to check those boxes, identify this way in kind of like some, some way that seems that it has some kind of meaning because usually those kind of meaning definers are from subordinated or marginalized spaces. So I did not ever have to be desc describing, self-describing, I guess, as a white person until 2003. Now, as the old person on the call, I'm the diversity hire as usual here. Um, as the old person on the call, I was born in 1974. So 2003, I went to a training I already had a master's degree and was already working in higher education at this point. I went to a training that did race-based caucuses and being an extrovert, which this will teach you extroverts not to talk out loud, I said, but where will we go? And that was the moment that I realized, one, I was part of a we, and two, I'm so white woman-y that I wanted to make sure I was doing it correctly because I didn't know what I was going to do during the race caucuses because race had never included the concept of white or um, any kind of European, Caucasian, etc. language had never entered my consciousness as an identity that I had. Race was always something other than me that I studied and advocated for and did ally work around, but I didn't know I was actually part of the category. And I'm really grateful to be here. Generally speaking, pre-COVID, I traveled around and did all kinds of keynotes and trainings or consulting work. And uh, post-COVID, I do a lot of traveling between here and the fridge and um, have been doing the work ongoingly, virtually, as well as like book clubs and other things like that. So I'm honored to be here. Thank you. Thank you for being here, Jess. Mr. James, my brother. What's from going brother. on? <laughs> I said, what's going on, my fellow bow tie brethren? Um, I'm not wearing. I'm not wearing one today, and I feel. I feel bad. I don't know why I didn't see that coming. Um, but uh, but yeah, super super excited to be here. My name is James uh, Robolata. I live on the other side of the apartment from Tina Van Steenbergen um, because we are partners, <laughs> um, and uh, that's pretty wonderful. So I also live in Minneapolis, but I'm born and raised in New York. Where my New York is at? I know we got Syracuse in the house. We got some New York City in the house. It's a beautiful thing. Uh, I'm a full-time professional speaker. I travel around the country when we're allowed to do that, and I talk to audiences about the role that authenticity and vulnerability must play in leadership and in life. Uh, and so out of that also comes a lot of my passion for doing DEI work. Um, as Tina mentioned, I, I also learned that I was white when I was 19, because uh, I grew up in a hometown where if you saw four or five black people walking together, you thought it was a movement, um, and you can't help where you grew up. Uh, and uh, I also learned in 19 that I wasn't taught the whole curriculum. 
that I was taught a part of the curriculum that made me feel safe and made me feel comfortable, and that bothered me. Um, and so, uh, so that's when I started to become passionate organization um, that I'm that I'm a part of, and I get to do a lot of work in the community as well um, in that space. Uh, and so I've been doing DEI work for about uh, five or six years, um, and it's been uh, it's been quite a journey of a lot of learning, a lot of listening, and occasionally speaking. So thanks for being here today, y'all. Thank you for being here, James. And definitely, last but not, definitely not least, let's go all the way beyond the borders to my good friend, Stefan. Thank you, thank you. It's so nice to be here, uh, especially with all the other folks. So uh, my name is Stefan Kallenberg. I'm an addict turned entrepreneur. Uh, and really, as I started to get into sobriety, reflect, on myself, I started to look at like, what was the impact that I'm having on the world? Um, and is it, at the time, it was helping sports teams make money. And was that the impact that I wanted to leave after I left? And the answer was no. And so I shifted, I started reflecting a lot, like what were the experiences that I had had and in my childhood, at many times we were kind of joking about this earlier, but I grew up overweight, having red hair and felt excluded. And I got, I got bullied, teased. It's not the same as racism, not at all, nowhere near, but I still felt that exclusion and kind of resonated with that. And I didn't want others to feel excluded, especially in the workplace. And then as I started doing more of this work and a lot of self-reflection, I started realizing that especially, I work very closely within the tech sector, they're like the the importance of having an equitable and diverse tech sector is uh, in my opinion one of the highest in the world because we're creating the future of society like the reality is that our world right now we're tech enabled if it is not involved with people from all different backgrounds that is huge and going to embed systemic problems into the future even kind of more than they are already embedded in our current state so that drove me to start crescendo um we are a, a start up here out of Toronto, uh, well, actually we're Toronto, Montreal, Ottawa, Halifax. We're a bit of a remote team now. Um, but really what we do is help global companies create more inclusive uh, and diverse workforces. And so our, our technology embeds into their workforce and, and helps their diversity and inclusion teams do more with less resources and less time. Awesome, thank you so much for being here. Um, all of you all, um, thank you all for being with me today. Um, and most importantly, for being my friends. Um, I really, really appreciate you all. So with recent events, you know, it's so great to have friends who have been aware and actively a part of the daily change, the change we need. And so today's conversation, uh, we seek to really unpack many topics. Um, however, to get us started, um, Jess, this has been your work since I've known you as a true advocate and practitioner for social change and justice. Um, in your book titled Good Enough, doing the best you can with what you have some of the time, so many great lessons and best practices within your book, and one of your reference according to the crucial conversation, and I quote, every sentence has a history, end quote. In our topic today, we utilize whiteness in our sentence. Will you level set with all of us to explain what is whiteness and what is white privilege? And selfishly, as a black man, I am curious to know, how do white people explain these terms to each other? Sure, so what is interesting is that, um, I, I just wanna take a second to acknowledge that it is also interesting on kind of a meta level of like, how do white people talk to each other about this, right? So we kind of shared that we like stumbled into the category to begin with. I'm pretty sure outsiders of me knew I was white before I did, right? So then like late to the party is huge. How do we then talk about it, right? So I just wanna put out there that what, are really important and through those long-term relationships which i mean we've been friends with for years and we will be for more years so we don't know what we don't know right now and part of our friendship is being able to have the space to learn things moving forward and so i think that when you're when those friendships are coming from in my case a life of privileged visible identities, I don't always have the opportunity to reflect on how I'm benefiting from these privileges unless I'm in some kind of intellectual, academic, hobbyist kind of manner. 
And I, I need to name that first because when I start talking about the hobby of doing white privilege awareness work, I also fully acknowledge that during my learning curve, other people are dying and hurting. I'm making mistakes that are hurting people. So my learning curve occurs during that pain. And both of those things are true. So if I'm going to talk about like, what do I think whiteness is, um, as I'm learning about this, that doesn't displace any responsibility I have for my own internalized or externalized systems of oppression that I benefit from or that suppress who I am as a person. Whiteness is the box I check when talking about my racial entity, and I'm not excluded from the conversation, but spending whatever 1974 to 2003 is years-wise, old, up until old to realize that, what I realized was is that part of the system of oppression that is race, that is socially constructed, that we made up, is that I actually think I'm not part of the conversation, which is exactly how it stays in place. So my like well-intentioned book purchases is studying this thing that's in an aquarium that doesn't actually impact me until I realize there is no glass, right? So where what whiteness is, is the benefit that I accidentally and also at times consciously feel entitled to of navigating a privileged dominant space in our society. So what that means is not rolling out my resume of every person of color I've ever slept with or given birth to or been in a relationship with <laughs> or had a boss or a neighbor, right? That does not distance me. Number two, I was in the Peace Corps. Yes, of course you were, Becky. Sit down. Number three, anytime you've ever been to any place where like you're one of the only white people in the room and you're like, what is going on? Like, it is important to reflect that that does also not absolve you from whiteness. Whiteness is the entitlement of thinking that either of those three things gets you out of the conversation of what it means to benefit from whiteness. So that, that would be my initial answer. No, and I thank you for sharing that perspective. And so many times, you know, we hear the terminology, you know, color blindness and what I call color credit. And that's that that's basically saying, hey, you know, my best friend is black. You know, my neighbor is black. Oh, when I played sports in high school, we did have four black people uh, on the team and we actually rode in the car together. So I think it's very, very interesting how everyone comes to the term of whiteness and to your point that discovery um, is definitely um, personal, depending on where you at in your culture and your climate. And speaking of recent events, the killing of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and Mr. Arbery, countless other, others seem as if more and more white people are curious of this protest, civil unrest, and the interests of Black Lives Matter movement. You know, it's, it's really, really been interesting and I would like to take this next portion to Tina and James. Um, you, you both live in Minneapolis, or you both live in Minneapolis, um, and where you witness, you know, what we all witnessed, the traumatic murder of uh, George Floyd on May 25th, you know, especially where we, I mean, oh man, I can just, I get, I get emotional in thinking about the video that I saw of a person who looked like me, a black man, life leaving his body while he's calling out for his mama you know and i would love for our audience you know to really hear your perspectives and how each of you all chose to respond in that moment um and i'm curious to know did anything shift in your world as a white woman and a white man if so how yes uh yes um, and I think both really positive ways and really problematic ways, right? So I grew up here and it wasn't even until we moved back here in the last year that I learned about how segregated a city we live in. Minneapolis has some of the top three best schools in the country for white kids and the bottom three worst schools in the country for black children. So like, we live in a city that this racial unrest that's bubbling to the surface isn't new here. 
people have been segregated into various sections of the city for a really long time. And living here, of course, I didn't know that. Of course, we didn't talk about that. And of course, I didn't seek out that education myself, right? Minnesotans have this delightful reputation for being just like the world's nicest Midwestern people. Turns out you can be nice and racist at the exact same time. So um, growing up here didn't, it wasn't connected at all to what race meant in this town. And then when George Floyd was murdered, were sort of plopped right in the epicenter of what was happening in race, in this town, in this country, in this world. And we, George Floyd died on Monday, and on Tuesday we went to uh, protest, stand, march, and listen more than anything else. And I don't know that we did that intentionally, I don't, uh, I, but standing there, listening to the voices of humans in this community, members of George Floyd's family, um, seeing where you watched the video, which feels like you're far away from it, but standing literally right there next to it and feeling the pain of this community. I don't, I don't know how that doesn't shift things. Was that my first protest ever? No. Was that my first protest in Minnesota? Yeah. And from that moment on have continued to be in it in really great ways because we've had more conversations in our home. We've had more conversations with friends and family and people that we otherwise never would have talked to about some of these events, especially in Minnesota. My delightfully Midwestern mother and I haven't talked a lot about race. We have now because we are all right here sort of listening and participating differently. The problematic side to that is why does it hurt so much more or feel so much more important just because it's happening outside my front door? This is not the first time we've watched a black person get murdered by the police on television. And, but this is, the, this is one of the first times that it has pulled me out of my body and into a whole other space, right? And um, so I'm, I'm very grateful that we live here, but I'm also very cognizant of some of the problematic pieces of our comfortable white life that I don't know would have been as disrupted if we didn't live here. James? Yeah. I mean, I mean, Tina hit the nail on the head. Uh, it is simultaneously super empowering to be living in the epicenter of change in this country. Um, and that is really exciting um, or potential change. Let's call it potential change. Let's be honest here. Um, and the potential change in this country uh, while simultaneously uh, getting to leave that area of town and come back to our loft apartment with you know, gorgeous windows in our building filled with white people. Um, and it, it, was, uh, it was a fascinating juxtaposition of, uh, of, of just, it, it literally was smacking you in the face of like, your world is different, bro. Um, and, uh, and yes, I grew up in, in New York, um, but you know, I, I told you about my hometown and then we were fortunate enough to live in Brooklyn for a number of years. I lived in Man Manhattan and Harlem for a number of years. And that was, and that was all well and good, but no matter where I go as a white person, I could, I could find my bubble. <laughs> I'm going to be fine. Um, and, uh, and, and so, uh, what I believe Tina and I have been doing is very intentionally putting ourselves in it as much as we can. Um, so that's multiple protests a week um, and also a lot of service projects as well, like, and where we can actually have conversations with individuals who are going through whatever time that they are going through uh, because of, <laughs> oh, the pandemic also, um, right? Because of so many of these things. Um, and so it has been, uh, it's been super illuminating. Uh, and there's a whole bunch of, you know, when we moved to Minnesota, I didn't know much about this state. I know there's around 10,000 lakes and people are really nice, don't you know? Um, but, uh, but, you know, also outside of that, I knew that this is also the largest population of Somalians outside of Somalia in, in, uh, in Minneapolis. So I was like, oh, cool, moving to the diverse state. It's great. They got the, the third largest pride in the country. Like, oh, it's the, man, we're moving into, we're moving into a beautiful navy blue dot right here. Um, and no... <laughs> No, that's not that's not what happens. Um, and uh, and so yeah, so I've been we've been also doing a lot of work 
um, you know, what, buying books, um, checking where we shop, checking, checking where we, you know, what are our patterns? When I look on Yelp, I'm a, I'm a bit of a foodie. Um, and uh, most of the restaurants with the most reviews in towns like Minnesota are white owned restaurants. Um, and so it's like, oh, shoot, I've been going to these highly reviewed restaurants, but who owns those, right? Who who wrote the books that I'm reading? Who, uh, you know, who am I listening to? And so those things have drastically shifted in a really beautiful way, but in also a, you know, just because you did this work doesn't mean you were ever even close to being done doing this work. Do ne never call yourself an ally, brother, um, and just keep hustling. Um, so yeah, so that's what I would say. Yeah, so I Stephanie, I definitely I'm coming to you next, but I, I wanna I it was several things that you all said, you know, knowing you both personally, James and Tina, uh, James, uh, a lot of our viewers may not know you joined one of the uh, prestige of historically African American um, undergraduate uh, was a collegiate uh, fraternity, um, and it's it's not undergraduate, it's also alumni. Uh, so I'm also interested to know that perspective. Uh, did that help? with your awareness, your epiphany um, in these moments? Because some people, uh, probably when you went back to your loft, some of the white folks, they were still just, uh, you know, just and nothing is happening. Tina, you know I know you, you know, and I know that we have had several conversations in our graduate studies about uh, turning, turning the table and understanding uh, from marginalized communities and, you know, how, how can we all walk together but I, I'm just curious to know, uh, did, did that help you guys respond, you know, in this moment with action? Um, or because as we all know, this, this has always been going on. Like I can never, as a black man, I never turned this, I mean, I, I knew this as a little boy, so I never turned it off. So I was just curious based on, was it anything that happened in your previous life or former life that you want to share that potentially have helped you respond quicker to this movement? I think so. I think so a little bit. Uh, I mean, I, my biggest pet peeve, one of my biggest pet peeves, there are many in this instance, is hearing people say, let's start the conversation. It's, it's, no, 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 no. <laughs> you're, you're finally joining the conversation. And here's the thing. When my friends come to a party, I don't care when you show up, just please show up, right? So welcome. Come on through. Grab yourself some punch. Um, but, uh, but the fact of the matter is this conversation's been happening. Mm -hmm. um, and so for me, I think one way that my fraternal involvement has really happened, uh, helped, and this has also been illuminating, uh, very illuminating for me, is that uh, like when, we, when, it, when it came time to figure out, okay, where do we go? How do we help? What do we do? It's like, oh, shoot, we just, we just moved here a year ago. It's like, I don't really have any black friends here yet, but fortunately, my fraternity brothers are tapped into that community, and I hadn't tapped into it yet because we just finished unpacking boxes and other excuses. Um, and so, uh, so, but that was a, a really amazing community that I could lean into, be like, yo, come here, we're making a move here, we're cleaning up here, we're marching here. Um, and that has been extremely helpful uh, for me to be able to get tapped into, uh, to get tapped into it. But yeah, I mean, I have, I joined my organization uh, because I became passionate about civil rights because of what I was never taught. Um, and, uh, and so, yeah, so all of those things definitely tied into it and I believe did help. Awesome. Tina? I, because I'm married to James, I also get to reap the benefits of some of his network connections, which have been genuinely helpful to us as we find our way to protests and cleanups and, and volunteer spaces, which is really wonderful. I have a bunch of friends because I grew up here. I have a bunch of friends that have been tapped into the community for a really long time. And so a couple of friends who live literal blocks away from where some of the worst fires existed in our city. And so having local connections was also incredibly helpful. Um, but I don't, I don't know that there was a moment. I, I know that I grew up uh, lower socioeconomic class. Todd, this is where you and I started our conversations in grad school, right? Like, I grew up poor and, and was a first generation college student and was set back in a lot of ways. And you asked earlier about how we talk about white privilege. And this is one of the things we talk about with our white people, my white friends, our white communities, right? It's not that I haven't struggled in my life, it's that race isn't one of the reasons I've struggled in my life. There is empathy and connection to the struggle of race, but I've never had to wonder if I'm being followed in a grocery store or been stressed about the police unless I'm actually doing something illegal. But that's a privilege that I move through with life. Race is not one of the ways that I've struggled. I think tapping, I think 
empathy is powerful. And I think when humans can tap into the fact that we have all struggled in some way, shape or form, struggle connects us together and that can help, right? As long as you can also identify the fact that my struggle isn't race, that doesn't make that struggle any more or less important, but race isn't my struggle. Struggling has helped me connect with the struggles of people of color and helped me learn and listen because I can empathize with some of those feelings, even though those experiences are so different. But I don't know, there was this like one crucible moment where because I had this one experience in my life, I now care more, feel more comfortable showing up right now, right? I think mm -hmm. I would just don't, I feel like not showing up is the wrong thing to do. And I don't, I don't think that's because I'm special. I just think this, this is right or wrong and we got to show up right now. Thank you for that. I, and you know, once again, you know, we, we have seen this quote by many, uh, but it's, isn't it, I don't know. I hear, see people, you know, not in this group today, but I've heard colleagues say, wow, it's, you know, I don't, I'm so, I'm so stressed. I'm trying to just do the right thing. And I'm just like, wow, you're stressed in this moment. <laughs> uh, walking my skin, you know, once again, it is a privilege to uh, learn about race instead of experience it, especially from racism. Uh, Stefan, let's go to you, my brother. You are a Canadian and a diversity and inclusion professional. Um, and there's a history um, in, in Canada about Africville, uh, where a community of Black Canadians existed in the 1800s, and then they were swept away in the 60s by the city. But today, going back to the point of what we heard earlier about diversity in Minnesota, or, uh, you know, Canada prides itself on being multicultural. Uh, but according to 2016 Canada census, Canada is around 73% white. And I was a little surprised by that. Uh, but I'm curious to know your perspective. Are there similar movements um, in Canada related to the Black Lives Matter uh, movement? And if so, uh, are the perceptions similar to white Canadians? Um, I, of course, I've seen mm -hmm. several countries, you know, messaging about embracing that movement or the Black Lives Matter movement. And some declare that race is just a issue in the US. So what are your thoughts? So it's interesting, like Canada, we get the stereotype of being polite, but I think this is actually does a disservice in these things because we, and like, we think we're nice and great and we don't have these types of problems. So a lot of people, when the Black Lives Matter movement started, there was actually, it was like hashtag meanwhile in Canada trending, being like, oh, we don't have problems here. Essentially, that was the feeling of that hashtag. But the reality is, is that we do also have problems. Um, here, I would say, it's kind of a combination of black and indigenous lives, much more so than just black. Um, like for example, like an indigenous person in Canada is 10 times more likely to have been shot and killed by a police than a white person since 2017. So like that problem is still very real. The other thing, when we look at this, like this particular moment in time, um, there's been a few deaths recently, uh, Regis uh, Kirkinski Paquette, as well as Chantel Moore, um, both women who got wellness checks um, and ended up dead. So like this is still a very real, this is a very real problem in Canada. The RCMP, our military, our kind of essentially militarized police here, were created to remove black and indigenous people from their land so that settlers could set up shop and, and live there. So like, it's very real. We don't like to admit it. A lot of people like to say, oh, well like, this is so much worse down in the States. But like the reality is like, no, we do have a lot of problems here. There have been quite a few marches. Um, but I, I do see change starting to happen. I do see people starting to recognize it, doing that work. Uh, the government has started some reconciliation work. It's still a long way to go, but um, it is very real here in Canada. Yeah, I, I, I appreciate that. And that, thank you for sharing um, some of that history. Um, and I, I think it's very interesting, you know, um, definitely you're in the diversity and inclusion space. Uh, and do you, do you identify as a white Canadian, by the way? I didn't ask you that. I don't yes. want to assume. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, you know, these days, you know, you should not make assumptions. However, I want I'm curious to know, uh, what is your experience showing up um, in the diversity and inclusion space as a uh, white Canadian or a white male in general? Yeah, I'm extremely mindful of how I show up um, because a big part of this is that we cannot center ourselves as white people when doing this. We have to center the needs of marginalized communities when doing this work. And so there are definitely places like, and I've still, I've, I've still, 
I've wanted to act fast and make like very quick changes. Like, especially when all this was starting out, there was like, there was uh, someone on, on Twitter who had posted about a negative experience um, with uh, the CBC. And I jumped on it. It was like, hey, I want to help you. I want to get you support. But I hadn't actually checked in and see what type of support, how do they want support. And I, I got checked. A friend of mine called me and was like, hey, maybe like, I love the intention here, but like, you should check in first before jumping full stream ahead. Because I had set up like an automated email where if you could, you clicked it, it would email the CBC and be like, hey, this, check out this tweet thread. And like, I was like, I want to support this and drive this and like help create change. But also check, you have to be, we have to check ourselves and be like, hey, like who am I now? Or is this best for the community? So that's something I'm still working on, still learning. Um, it's extremely important. I think also for us being a, like a vendor in the DNI space and being white. So like we're half our team are people of color, but there's an, like it's mostly like um, Southeast Asian. Uh, we have one, there's one black member on our team and the rest, then we've got like half a white team. So it's still like, we're very conscious of this. Um, and with all the anti-racism work that is happening right now, we made the decision that we are not going to profit anything off of that. We are going to use our platform and privilege to funnel money to communities. And so we have partnered with a few black diversity, equity, inclusion consultants to help co-create some of this learning and, and, and content, as well as donate the rest of the proceeds to uh, charities supporting the black community. So this was like a conscious decision by us, like, hey, we could make money off of this right now. We're in a spot we could easily do that but we are not going to because we recognize that we are not majority black owned and we need to divert those funds to these communities at this time. So these are like a couple of the things that we think about, especially being white in this work um, that are really important. Uh, yeah, thank you so much for sharing that. And, and, I, and I think that's very helpful because sometimes, especially as men who identify as white men and women and you're coming in and helping join the diversity committee, you know, at your job. And, and, I, and I do hear in our work a lot, you know, it's like, oh, I'm not diverse, so I'm not going to join the committee, or they're not talking about me, et cetera. And so a lot of white individuals tend to not go to those meetings or show up to those discussions because of those insecurity and lack of knowledge. Um, and speaking of knowledge um, and a debate, one of the golden questions in debate we continue to see uh, with in light of recent events around Black Lives Matters versus All Lives Matters. So I open this up to all of you all. Uh, what is your take on that? What is your perspective? All Lives Matter can't matter until Black Lives do. <laughs> Like yeah. that's yeah, but Jess, you you put up yeah, you had your hand. I just volunteered to go first. Yeah. Um, I I without it sounding like I'm digressing from the question, I promise I'm coming there. But I also want to make sure that if we're talking about whiteness, it's also very important to understand that this is a panel mm -hmm. of white people who are doing work, trying to do work, trying to stay in the work, doing the work for other folks, etc and how whiteness also shows up. So if just watching the comments and things like that, I just want to put out there that while we are focusing primarily on Black Lives Matter, like no one has ever said only Black Lives Matter. And it is just an example of why no lives can matter until there is a, a clear understanding of the system that delineates value of a life. Mm -hmm. And so I, I think it's important to mention that there are white people who do not agree with us and they are not on this call, right? I have a brother who would not be on this call and is not watching this, I checked. Um, and <laughs> when we understand that whiteness comes with that on a group membership level, there is also a group membership level of like the three of us have in common, or the four of us, I looked at the three other boxes, the four of us have in common along with our other allies who are doing white work, right? But on a group membership level, we are responsible for this. And if we only focus on, look at us, we're doing good work, and we don't claim responsibility for the rest of our group, right? Mm -hmm. Then we can't actually engage in a conversation about what's the difference between Black Lives Matter and All Lives Matter when we don't also take into consideration where the work that I have done around Black White is also now silencing the racism that API communities are experiencing right now, if we just take this second of COVID with George Floyd and everything else, we don't take into consideration by multiracial 
experiences at the hands of whiteness and not being able to navigate a white world and not being able to fully navigate a world of color because of how white do not believe what I believe on a moral level. I do not mean politics. This is not a partisan issue. I don't mean religion, right? But on a moral level, what the value of sentient beings are, which it's a different workshop. We start talking about the ocean and air and trees, but that's a good combo. And some people would rather have that conversation than why they value black and indigenous lives differently than Asian, biracial, multiracial, Middle Eastern, Southeast Asian, et cetera, lives differently. And until we have that conversation, that is exactly why Black Lives Matter and Black Lives Thank you. Uh, three quick things. One, I don't do a lot of debating in this department because I don't have a lot of patience to debate in this department, um, which is maybe not the appropriate choice to make, but um, I, I don't believe it's a debate, right? And so when you come at me with all lives matter, I don't, first of all, if all lives matter, then why are you so mad? Because what, don't all lives matter include, right? Like it, there is so much in there, there's so much cognitive dissonance in that understanding and in that argument that was brilliantly crafted to be exactly that. But the point is that it, 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 it carries no weight. It is not a, just, <laughs> carrots are vegetables. That doesn't mean that broccoli is not a vegetable. It doesn't mean that lettuce isn't a vegetable. Saying that carrots are a vegetable doesn't take away any other vegetable identity and doesn't make them any, doesn't, no one's saying that carrots are the best vegetable. That's not what we're saying, right? So like, that's also not my example. I stole it off the internet. So the point is that what, because the race is spoken about as a value and a, as one group of one person, one, one type of human has more or less value. And when we debate the fact that whether or not black lives matter, if you, say, if you can't say that sentence out loud, then what you're telling me is that you don't believe all lives matter. So there's so much contradiction in it that I have a really frustrating time having the conversation and we can use the vegetable analogy we could use the listen everybody lives in a house but if one house is on fire you don't spread water all over all the houses you put the water toward the house that's on fire that analogy also makes sense but I don't know that analogies are going to get us where we need to go when we're debating whether or not human beings actually matter I don't I, isn't that interesting I mean it's like we're this is the debate we're talking about this, okay, sorry. This is this is this is why I lift up this panel because I so many times the black and brown person in the room is usually the one who has to get on the panel and tell us and tell everybody how we're feeling and what they can do. So this is I, I love listening. I'm practicing. I'm listening, and I'm really curious to know. Let's move into some action. Let's move into some action. How how can one begin? Because Jess, as she said, hey, your brother's not tuning in. Um, I also hear this debate of like, hey, we're not going to talk about this because we're bringing in politics in our organization. How, what is your advice, any of you all, what is your advice to white people on how to begin the conversation with other white people about race, racism, or even if you want to go a step further, understanding anti-racism and that development? Any, any quick advice? Where to begin? I have one sentence and then I promise I will not talk anymore so we can hear more. And that is morality is not a partisan issue. I wish it was. I wish morality was a partisan issue because then we would actually be able to do bar bipartisan work, but it's not. There's one sense of morality and that is it. This is not about moral relativism. This is about actual people dying while you're picking a battle. Yeah. I, my, like, I, I have, interesting thoughts on like starting the conversation with other white people. I think that it's important to do your work first before talking about it as well. Like I think that there's a lot of self-reflection, a lot of learning, a lot of consuming before you start talking as well. So I think it's good, it's important for us to talk to our white colleagues and discuss this, but it's also really crucial that you have some you've done some learning, you've done some reflection yourself, so you have something to go into that conversation with. Um, so first steps, like the bare minimum, like if you have Netflix, go watch 13th, watch When They See Us. Um, 
that those will like wake you up to what has been happening to black folks in America um, for a long time. And I think those like that's almost a good way to start a conversation of like, hey, let's watch this movie together. Let's watch the show together and then talk about it. I'm pretty sure there's discussion guides online even as well that you could have that conversation with. But I think it's important to start this with some reflection uh, before talking. It was, see, it's interesting that you say stand woke. I think I heard woke, uh, you know, and talking about wokeness, because uh, I know we, people use that term loosely, but the, you know, stand woke, being woke is actually, you know, it came from the African-American community, my community, as an alert to injustice in society, especially racism. And so I'm curious to know your take, James. Is there a such thing as a woke white person? And if so, how does one live woke? I think you're, uh, there we go. First off, uh, thank you so much for letting us borrow the term woke. That was really nice of y'all. Um, appreciate you. <laughs> Uh, and by borrow, I mean, we just took it like we did everything else anyway. Um, but, uh, but still, uh, is, is there such thing as a woke white or first off, if you're walking around saying that you are woke, you have successfully missed the point. Um, you have successfully, uh, you, so you need to get over yourself. Uh, no one wins in the woke Olympics, um, right? No one's getting an award for being the most woke. No one gets an award for going to the most marches, posting the most things on their story, coming up the most creative. Uh, what's my Chipotle order? Uh, barbacoa, uh, rice, and uh, arrest the cops to kill Breonna Taylor, right? Like, no one gets an award for coming up with the funniest thing around that. No. So, I mean, uh, it's... So I think it's it's awareness uh, for sure. And I think I mean like like uh, exactly uh, what Sebet said is it's about it's about putting in the work, right? But it also goes back to what Alan Iverson once said. Um, and Alan, Alan Iverson's famously uh, had the quote of "Practice." Are we talk about practice? And yes, my friends, we are talking about practice right now because you need to open your mouth. You need to practice saying these things. It's not, it's also not, okay, I watched 13th. Okay, I watched all these movies. Okay, I figured it out. Okay, I memorized 12 Years of Slave. All right, I've read all these books. Okay, I, I high-fived all these, I, I follow all these people. Now I am ready to talk. It's like, that's awesome. Thanks. <laughs> uh, thanks for doing that work. But you need to start opening your mouth right now as well. Um, and you need to start talking because you get that practice of learning those words, right? Like I listen to Jess Pettit talk and I am, uh, I'm, in, I'm intimidated because of the way that she has the knowledge and the linguistics and the, all of that stuff. I'm not there, but I am somewhere. So just because you don't bring everything into the room doesn't mean you don't bring anything. Um, and so that is why it's important to start to talk, but also be ready, be ready and willing to be cor corrected. It is a compliment to be corrected on the things that you said wrong, because that means somebody says, hey, you're worth our time. You're worth my time to give you feedback. It is a compliment to be corrected, even though it feels like crap, um, but you need to open your mouth so that you can learn the right language. You don't learn, <laughs> did you learn to swim before or after you got in the pool? I think that's important to think about here. Yeah, I, I thank you. Oh, so go ahead, Tina. Sorry, go ahead. I just want to say, I agree with everything that James said, as long as you're not speaking just so that a person of color, a black person, an indigenous person will pat you on the head and say, good job. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. That's yes. my problem with people who want to identify as a woke white person, because it feels like a performance, right? We talk a yes. lot about performative allyship and you're showing up to look like you're doing it right, to look like a good white person, to look like somebody that black people, indigenous people, and people of color should look to as an ally. And frankly, you don't get to decide if you're an ally because that's not what being an ally is about. And so do the work, speak, watch those movies. But if you only watch them so you can put them on your Instagram and people will send you clapping emojis because congratulations, you did some good white person stuff today, then you're doing it for the wrong reasons. Then you're not actually doing the work. You're performing doing the work. And those two things are very different. Wow. No, I, you know, it's so interesting. Um, talking about doing the work and open your mouth. Um, and it's, I recently 
uh, received a call from a colleague and they started the conversation as business as normal after the, the murder. Um, that was our first time back to work. And they, and they said, oh, I'm, I'm so sorry, Todd. I, I'm, 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 I'm definitely more woke than that. <laughs> that is definitely the term they used to me. Uh, but, and we unpacked that. Uh, but, you know, once again, this is the conversation I would love for you all to give your feedback on. Uh, and, and also, in the, you know, talking about people posting on social media, you know, we saw a, a, a big trend and wave of everyone being blacked out on their screens and then they're, everyone is putting like Black Lives Matter and, you know, sharing and, you know, all those great stuff, uh, you know, um, bringing attention and awareness to their community. Uh, and my friend Brittany Cole out of Tennessee, uh, she just recently wrote a piece in the article. I think you all should definitely check it out, her opinion. And it's titled, it's titled, excuse me, is your apology louder than your allyship? Your allyship? And from your perspective, like how can white people practice this thing? Because we do hear a lot of apologies and I'm not in the, I'm not saying apologies are wrong uh, or anything. I'm not, that's not my statement, but I do hear a lot of apologies. We hear it from corporations. We hear it from individuals. We hear it from neighbors. We hear it from white people. So I'm curious to know what is your thoughts and your perspectives of how can one really truly be an ally? Anyone, Stefan, let's start with you, buddy. Yeah, I like my, like I, there was someone put, it was a, a learning and development manager from Asana put it really well. It's like, you shouldn't be worried about what other people think of your allyship. If you are, it's coming from the wrong place. You're thinking about like, how should, like, am I being a good ally? It's like, you're still thinking and centering yourself in that. You're still like, oh, am I good? So that's where it's coming from. So I think it's really important if you want to practice allyship, checking yourself, being like, where is this motivation coming from? Like, uh, like just being very real with yourself. Because if you don't, if you can't be real with yourself at the start, it might swerve your decisions in certain ways. And if you can come to the place where it's like, hey, I'm doing this because I want to support and I want to change these systems of oppression. I want to impact this. Then just follow that. Like, listen to black people and what they need. They're telling us, if you Google how to support black people during, like, there's a million things, like, a million. Donate, sign petitions, call your, your, uh, your person, the person. Venmo them. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like, Venmo a black person. Like, there's, like, lots of things you can do that do not require any thought or consideration. Like, giving money, that's, you can't be bad at giving someone money. Like, you can donate. I mean, I guess you can, depending on the organizations you donate to. But, like, the, in the general sense, like, if you give money, like, that, you don't have to check yourself on, am I being a good ally? Like, just do that and support those people um, and, and, like, support breaking down these oppressive systems. Thank you. Thank you so much. I support, support, speak up, show up, and, 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 and give up. Yeah. <laughs> I think I think what else I, I, oh go ahead go ahead Stephen finish your thought I want to add the one last thing on there I think like the amount that white people have benefited from generational wealth like we need to disrupt that and like because of slavery because of the mass incarceration like we now have earned so much money and we need to shift that back like we need to help move that back and and like if honestly I might a friend of mine said that up, he's like there should be a white tax this is a very controversial thought, but like if like if you benefited from generational wealth, like there should be an extra tax for you to go back to people who have not had that same benefit. But I mean, that's maybe a bit more of a provocative discussion. But like the idea is there. Like we need to redistribute this wealth. Yeah, uh, that is provocative, but I like provocative. Um, <laughs> I uh, <laughs> the one thing I would say to kind of combine some of those two questions is also is is thinking about who you talk to first. Like you can't, like if you're, if you're new to the scene of speaking up and trying to get out there, like you can't walk up to the first MAGA hat wearing, uh, like, I mean, like you can't, like that's not, that's not where to start. Um, uh, there's a good, uh, a good friend of ours who, uh, who wrote a book called motivating the middle. Um, and it's interesting where you break, you break populations up into thirds. Um, and you have your people that really get it, your people that, that are there, they kind of show up and then your people that they're not showing up. Um, and when you're trying to motivate your team to show up, like in a company or an organization, you have to motivate the middle because the bottom third is 
they're going to be the bottom third. That's just what's going to happen. Um, and so who are those individuals in that middle tier that are like, I don't know, like, if, for example, you know, I think a lot about my parents. Um, and, and my parents are, uh, they're liberal, they marched on Washington against the Vietnam War, they got super stoned and went to Woodstock, right? Like, I mean, they're liberals, they're doves. Um, but, uh, um, but at the same time, um, they've never had conversations about whiteness before, and they never really thought about it. But now they are, that is a really great great place to start having that conversation. Don't be like, all right, where are all the people who have opposite political beliefs than me? I'm coming for you. Like that's not, that's not where we, that's not where we go first. Um, so that's what I would well, say. James, if I can piggyback on that too, like looking at some of the comments that are coming in on Facebook live. So if first off action paralysis is still an action doing nothing is still there's still a verb involved right mm -hmm. and so like when you're like oh, I don't, I don't, I don't. well you have chosen to not do something consciously or unconsciously that is the action that you are taking so i think that mind shift when you're like well i don't know what to do well doing nothing is already doing a something so you've already like gotten to the gym right like you're already in a bucket of verbs now you just get to pick one Instead of the paralysis is like, ah, burbs, like doing nothing. You're already, you've already done the hard part because you are now in the scenario. So in the scenario, what are you going to do? That helps a little bit. And what I really liked about what you said, which pairs with something that Jessica Ryan said in the Facebook feed, when you were talking about woke, right? Is that like, oh, yes, you can. Because you can stay, you can wake up, you can do your homework, you can pay attention, you can read, you can watch all the movies. And I'm paraphrasing and possibly taking Jessica's comment out of her context. But what is fascinating to me is I don't know anybody who can do that every day, all day long, etc. And the biggest difference, and this gets back to whiteness, is that it's a hobby for white people to study racism. My life is more difficult because of what I choose to think about. I do not think about this all the time. I mean, I appreciate the shout out that you think I'm articulate, right? Finally, a white person gets called articulate. How exciting. Mm. But the reality is, is I go to sexy brunch on Netflix binge. I screw up, right? When Black Lives Matter first started, a hundred percent i went through my phone and anybody who looked black that i was facebook friends with i sent them a facebook message to tell them that their life mattered to me do i know these people no i don't know them you know that's called tokenization so that i feel better while crying because that's how white women roll i've never been a white dude maybe it's similar i don't know that i screw up constantly and so that's why, like, one of the things I don't want to get lost in this statement is that you don't get to decide you're an ally. Yeah. Somebody else has to validate those receipts. And you don't even know you're making a purchase. That's when you're doing it right. Is that this is a moral issue of just how you live, Tina, come on in. And you can't wait until you get it perfect to do it at all. And that's really challenging. Because when you do it wrong, it creates hurt. You can say the wrong thing and cause hurt. I said the wrong thing caused hurt six days ago. Like you have, and like you have to own that and sit in it and deal with it. But if you wait until you have it perfectly right to do anything, then nothing is ever going to change. Then, then we're actively choosing to do nothing, which is choosing to not participate, which is the privilege of being white, that we get to choose to participate in race, in conversations about race, in issues and movements about race. That is the choice that we get to make because it is not something that we function with every single day. And if you choose to do nothing because you're afraid to do the wrong thing, then you've chosen to do nothing. And that speaks volumes. I am not somebody that likes to do things I'm not good at. I'm not good at all of this. And if I wait until I'm good at it to do it, then I'm never going to do anything. And that is potentially more harmful. Wow. And, and, I, and, and see, this is powerful because I'm always interested to see, you know, um, how everyone show up in this space. I always can give my recommendations, but I really think it's fascinating. And I want people to understand that, you know, from my perspective, you, you have to be a student. You, you have to sit back, listen, and engage. Uh, but you have to listen first before you speak. Um, and I will also say, just don't be a student. You have to be a student teacher to your own people, 
Go out and teach your family. Go out and teach your neighbors who look like you what you have learned because it's, it's, it's very powerful. And, you know, you think about this academia space, it's very powerful when you can master something, right? And you master something by being able to teach it and articulate it. And so if you don't leverage that ability of what you have learned to put it into action, it's, it's basically dead. So we definitely need some action steps out of this. And I know we're really at time. And so panelists, I want you all to close us out with, you know, what is your final thoughts of what people can do right now? And thank everyone for engaging in the chat. Uh, I see there's several questions there that we were able to address. But if there's any burning questions before we um, log off, feel free to put it in at this time and we'll see if we can pose it to the panelists. But as we wrap up, um, I really would love for you all to know we have clearly the people who have tuned in today. They, 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 they're interested and they're doing something, they wanna do something more. And what I see in this space a lot is that, hey, how can I motivate others to come along with us on the journey? Um, and so I'm just curious to know, any, anything you all, final thoughts around what people can do right now and, um, and, and how they can continue these conversations beyond today's discussion. I, so I, I put this thought out on LinkedIn the other day, but with COVID-19, if you still, I'll put the caveat, that if you still have your job, because I know a lot of people have gotten laid off, but if you were planning a vacation somewhere, like a big fancy overseas vacation, that most likely got canceled because of COVID. How much money did you save from that vacation. Can you now go instead say, hey, I'm gonna have a vacation in my living room and donate that to black trans lives. Like just just doing that and like taking that step, like, hey, I was already gonna spend this money. I was gonna do this to go have a fun vacation somewhere, but can I take two weeks of like staying in my house instead of going to some fancy all-inclusive resort and then take that money I was planning to spend and donate it to black trans lives. Like, it's a big yes it's a big ask but you you were checked out you'd spent that money already almost so it's like that's let's take some big steps thank you big steps james justina uh sure <clears throat> uh i think it's very simple um listen unlearn listen relearn listen action um, I think that that's what a lot of it comes down to. Um, it's, it's a lot of listening. Uh, if, if your voice is the loudest in the room, um, then you're not doing the right thing and your insecurities are showing, bro. Um, and so, <laughs> uh, so with that being said, um, yeah, I, I love, again, donating. Um, also, a lot of companies out there are doing a lot of matching. Um, so finding some of those companies, and even if it's not your company, uh, I mean, Tina and I did a fundraiser and, uh, and we matched those funds and now we're finding some other company that we don't work for to match our funds, right? Like use the system um, as well, play, let, it, let it play the game. Um, and so I think those things are important as well um, but I, I mean just keep showing up uh, you have to keep showing up like and, and maybe that looks like putting a reminder on your calendar um, in three weeks that like black lives matter right or maybe that looks like putting a reminder to watch a uh, you know but in doing a weekly uh, a weekly discussion with yourself or your partner or your friends where it's like hey we're watching this documentary this week we're watching this movie we're listening to this soundtrack and it doesn't always have to be it doesn't always have to be let me watch something that's going to rake everything a about what I thought I knew about the world over the coals. Sometimes it could also be like, yo, let me watch uh, Beyonce's uh, Lemonade, right? And let me watch that live performance. Let me go and listen to uh, some old uh, Marvin Gaye albums and actually listen to words. Let me listen to Nina Simone and listen to words, right? I thought like Strange Fruit, I thought that was about like some weird apples. You know what I'm saying? Like, like you know, listen to the words and go back. And doesn't always have to be this like, oh, I got I to listen to the darkest thing that's going to make me feel like a shitty white person. No. It's not because ultimately you've been appreciating and taking advantage of black culture for your entire life, but you don't really know what it's actually been telling you. And so going back and reading the lyrics and acknowledging what's going on, I listen to a ton of hip hop and I listen to hip hop because I love energy. Now I listen to hip hop because I also respect the lyrics. Um, and so things like that are what I would say places we can start. Thank you. I, I love that point about listen, unlearn, which is usually the hardest part and challenging where people really just want to jump into action without learning what they're doing. 
and why why it's important to um, unlearn, you know, especially when it comes to the historic piece, um, and really really keen in and lean in, if you will. Tina, final thoughts of what we can do now. Oh, sorry, what white people well, can do now? <laughs> we have to talk about what we're unlearn. We have to talk about what the word unlearn means because we've been learning and learning and learning. We ever since we're in, but two years old, we're learn. The whole point is to learn, learn, learn. But when you think about what pieces of history you were taught, what versions of history you were taught, what versions of culture you were taught, when we say unlearn, we have to recognize that everything we were taught, everything we've learned in our life, we've learned through the lens of white supremacy. And when you have learned everything you know about the world through white supremacy, then challenging white supremacy feels like it's tearing apart everything about your world. And the truth of the matter is that there's a lot of the world that exists outside of white supremacy if we can unlearn what that means and what it, what it means to be white in a white supremacist society versus not, right? So we have to unlearn it, which means we need to re seek out education from different resources, means we have to listen to different voices that we were never given the opportunity to listen before. And not just listen to them passively, but listen to them and let those new voices and those new narratives challenge what we have known to be true for so, so, so long. Because if we don't do the next step, then you're just continuing to absorb other cultures without taking the time to dismantle the stuff that comes with it, right? So yes, I want you to unlearn. One of the most powerful experiences I have had is um, a woman named Layla Saad has created a book, a workbook, a process called 20 Air, called Me and White Supremacy. And it is a 28 day challenge. And every single day you think about a different piece of your white identity in the context of white supremacy and have to unravel how you have benefited, how you have gained, what, how that has taught you about yourself in the world. And it, forces you to look in the mirror and accept that you have benefited and when you do that then you can unlearn you can learn to dismantle it you can unlearn it right so that's a powerful resource anybody can start that it's personal work you don't need to share it on the internet and the other thing i'd say is that um most of the things that we consume in the media that center black lives and bodies are tragic and um are either the the systems like police officers killing black men and women or um sports and music. And there is so much more to black culture outside of the specific areas that we take them in as white humans. Black joy is uh, something that you should seek out. Like, yes, I want you to go watch 13, but I also want you to go watch uh, Blackish and Pose and Dear White People. Right? Like, I want you to not just take in these really sad, tragic versions of blackness, because then it, I think it starts to make us think that that's what blackness means. And there is so, 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 so much more to black people, indigenous people, and people of color than those tragic stories we're told on the internet. Uh, and I, I think it's important to take in all of their humanity. All the humanity. I love that. Jess, close us out. So I'm going to do the whitest thing possible. And that is, once you've identified what you're scaredy pants of, write it on a post-it note. This is the thing you're scaredy pants of. Okay, great. Now go do something else. So let's say, for example, you're scaredy pants. So looking at some of the comments, let's say that as a white person, you're scaredy pants to talk to your like one coworker of color about racism. Okay. So write their name down and be like, okay, I don't have to talk to Amy today. Um, so I gotta go talk to somebody else. Here's my suggestion. If you are uncomfortable talking to somebody across difference, this case specifically across race, okay, notice that. Go have a conversation with a white person who has very different views than you. If that scares you, Amy's gonna look a lot better because Amy is already a friend or at least pretending to be your friend because you're coworkers, right? So that's, that's what's at risk here. If you can't have diverse friends who have different viewpoints and you can navigate the like, wow, I actually wildly disagree with you. One of my best friends who is watching this, and I just called him one of my best friends, is an evangelical super Christian who read my book and said that my book spoke to him like as if Jesus wrote it. That is not a testimonial I was planning on. And we can have a conversation now about what his take on Jesus is and what he got from my book. That is a weird, awkward conversation because I have practiced having a conversation where I don't already know the answers. And if you can practice that with your white friends 
Because you got white friends that you don't talk about certain things about because it's an off topic, you're not supposed to talk about it. Great, practice with the white people. Stop practicing with people who are trying to live. In the comments, the, and I, my audiences, etc., I see a very common theme of like, I want to make sure I'm doing this right. I was valedictorian of white woman school. I know what that means. I want to do things right. I'm worried about right versus wrong. And we're talking about an issue of with involving people who are trying to live. I am not worried about dying. I'm worried about not making an A+. Plus. How about you just take your little A+, plus, have a conversation with someone else that might give you a B-, minus, but you are guaranteed to be living in that conversation and work that muscle. Practice it out, right? Like, have a Zoom call. I am engaged with a weekly conversation with my brother during sheltering in place, largely because that is a conversation I am not interested in having. That is why I'm doing it, because if I can do that, then I can engage in other difficult conversations that are way easier than that conversation. And it's free. Free. We like free stuff. Thank you. You heard it. You, there, there you go. There you go. You heard it from the, 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 the advocates, the ones who are in, doing the work, the people who I consider, you know, my great friends. But I will tell you all, this has been definitely a powerful conversation. And I love your point, Jess, about really strengthening your muscles, um, your muscles to really have these conversations. And I, I will leave you all with the thought, first conversation should start with yourself. You know, you really need to examine how you're going to show up and, 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 and how you're going to progress through this situation. So many times when we work with organizations and we say, who wants change? Everybody raised their hand, and then I say, "Who would like to change themselves?" Then a lot of hands goes down, and I and I would like I would tell you that you have to start inside your heart and your mind, but don't let it stop there. Then you have to continue with your hands and your feet, and really have it, you know, show up in your behavior and your actions. And so I really want to say thank you all, my friends, James, Tina, Stefan, and Jess, for coming in and just sharing your nuggets. Please, please check them all out. They are all doing incredible things and you'll be able to see um, and be able to connect with them in our recap. And I would like to thank you all. Most importantly, all our audience, we've seen people from all over the world actually tuning in, um, a part of the Bowtie um, Conversation community. And I ask that you share what you learned today with others. Let's put some of the words into actions. Be the example in your family, your community, and in the workplace. Um, and, and let people know, share what it means to show up for Black lives and communities of color. So thank you all so much for bow tying it together with me today. Um, I definitely enjoyed um, the conversation, but if you enjoyed today's conversation, please.